Good morning, everyone. This is Lorraine Herger. I'm here to talk with you today about a subject we should all be interested in, diversity and inclusion in, in engineering education. Uh, I First of all, I'd like to thank the women in engineering for allowing me to take this time this morning and uh, also to the ABET uh, Board of Directors. So uh, I hope you all have the presentation which was sent out. And I'm going to go to page two, which is the agenda for the next hour. Uh, first of all, I'm going to talk a little bit about what is ABET, then talk about diversity and inclusion, why we're interested in it in engineering education, and then do some look at a deeper dive on the subject and what we can all do to promote this. I'm just going to pause here for a second. So if we move to page three, you'll see I'm going to talk a little bit about what is ABET. So ABET is a non-governmental agency that accredits virtually all of the engineering, technology, applied science programs in the United States and actually worldwide. And the goal of ABET in doing this is to promote the advancement of education worldwide. So that, uh, and also to promote a standard of education. So when people are certified to be engineers or they go out into the workforce, they actually then have a level of education which is similar to what everyone else has who has that degree. So uh, now we'll move to page four. Now, um, this is the ABET organizational structure. ABET has been around for nearly 100 years. Um, interestingly, it has a format which has a, uh, a staff, but the actual work of the organization, the accreditation of all the programs, is done by volunteers, around 2,200 volunteers. I'm actually uh, a member, I've been a volunteer since 2007, accrediting many programs, but I also am currently a member of the Board of Delegates, and that's the second item that's on that page there that you can see on page four. And in that role, I'm part of uh, a group that has been put together to look at diversity and inclusion in engineering education. So now let's move to page five. So on page five, you're actually gonna, going to see the logos of all of the member organizations of ABET. So myself and my profession, I'm an electrical engineer. I am a member of IEEE, a senior member of IEEE. But in my role in ABET, I am um, representing SWE, which you see on the right-hand side. So if many of you are either college students or professionals, you'll probably see your organization, whether it's civil engineering, mechanical, um, or, and a number of others, you'll see them represented in this chart. So all of these organizations work together with ABET to ensure that, that we have quality engineering education, both in the United States and around the world. So we'll move to page six. So these are the statistics of ABET. So as of last year, there were actually 30 over, as you can see, 3,500 programs accredited. And uh, you can see the various committees. Um, the C is for computing, EAC is engineering, engineering technology, and also applied uh, sciences, computing, etc. And as I mentioned, there are programs in the U.S. as well as outside the U.S. 
So I think one thing that I wanted to mention before I move on is why, uh, why would we care about ABET or what is it that ABET brings for all of us as pr uh, practicing engineers? Well, for the most part, a lot of companies, mainly big companies, do not allow their, um, the hiring of people who are not from accredited ABET program. So this is key. And secondly, you'll see that um, what if you are a PE, meaning a professional engineer, usually this is for a lot of civil engineers are PEs, you cannot sit for the PE exam unless you've graduated from an ABET accredited institution. So this is something that's important to um, all engineers. Okay, so now we'll move on to page seven. Um, and as I mentioned, in my role in ABET, I'm now part of the uh, Ad Hoc Committee on Diversity and Inclusion. And our charge, the charge of this committee, was to review ABET's current policy on diversity and inclusion and, very importantly, to consider the role of ABET in supporting diverse learner populations, and we'll talk about what that is, within the uh, wide range of accredited programs. So the real question is, as I noted at the bottom there, is can ABET, via these accreditation processes, promote diversity and inclusion in technical education? Which is um, a little bit challenging, because we're used to, especially as engineers, assessing items which are very clear, very black and white, have data to support them. And I think, as we all know, diversity and inclusion sometimes have different meanings to different people. So let's do a, from the introduction, let's just do a quick recap on, on what, what is diversity and inclusion. So diversity is about differences. So whether it's race, ethnicity, gender, physical abilities, religious beliefs, etc. Our world is very diverse. And the United States is a very diverse place because of the fact that most people in the United States came from somewhere else originally, whether it was your family came hundreds of years ago or they came last year. Uh, inclusion is more about behavior and mindset, as we say. So this is about respecting and valuing differences in people, and valuing that diversity and the benefit it brings, whether to your personal life or to your workplace or to education. And one of the things we, we note is you can increase diversity by doing hiring, but without inclusion, diversity is not sustainable. And that's something we'll talk a little bit about. So we move on to the next page, which is page nine, which is some pictorial views of um, diversity and inclusion. So we say that differences are not always visible. So we know certain ones are, such as language or, or gender. But there are many others which are not that obvious when you first meet people. Yet sometimes differences, because we may not be uh, used to it, can also make us uncomfortable. And so this is something that we need to think about, especially in our workplace as we work with many other kinds of people. So as we move on here to page 10, this is a um, interesting graphic which gives you the distinction between diversity and inclusion. So diversity does not equal inclusion. So on the left-hand side you see this is an organization represented by the little yellow dots, which has no diversity, no inclusion. It's just a very homogeneous environment. In the center, we're looking at what would be a pictorial representation of diversity. So there, the colored dots have moved inside. However, they're all grouped together and they're not integrated with the larger community. On the right-hand side, what we see is a diverse, and inclusive organization. And what that means is that the, the dots that are different color, which we're using to represent people, 
are integrated with the, the larger group. And this is, of course, the ideal, that you not only have diversity, but you also have inclusion. So moving on to page 11. This is another pictorial representation, in which we say, so on the left-hand side, you have a girl here invited to a dance. However, she's sitting there by herself, and it says diversity is being invited. Inclusion is being invited to dance. So in other words, just like the dots, being integrated with the larger whole. So moving on to page um, 12. So what is the motivation for diversity and inclusion in education and in industry and in academia? Well, first of all, it promotes competitive advantage. So industry, if when you look at uh, articles on many companies, they say, we want people to be diverse and we want to include them not just because of social justice or being doing the right thing or being politically correct, but because diverse environments bring out the best in people, they bring out new ideas, they help people to think differently or to understand how other people think, and potentially to create a more innovative environment. And this is really key to our uh, story here. It's not just about doing the right thing because it's the right thing to do, but it's also about bringing more value to your company. So moving on to page 13. So we'll talk a little bit about here about uh, the motivation. So the competitive advantage and what we've come to learn by research is that diverse organizations definitely have a competitive advantage over homogeneous organizations. So moving on to page 14, have here another pictorial representation. This is George Patton, who was a, a, a great general during the Second World War. And that quote from him kind of sums it up. If everyone is thinking the same thing, then basically no one is thinking at all. Because that basically means everybody's in their own comfort zone. We're all thinking the same. We don't have to ask questions. We don't get challenged. And really, that's an environment where you're not going to bring out the best in people. So moving on to page 15. Here we have some interesting uh, research that shows the link between diversity and innovation and why companies think that this is so important. So in a, a study of 2.5 million scientific articles, it showed that those with diverse authors received more citations. In other words, they were more interesting and brought more value to their readers. So there is a link between the team's eth ethnic mix and highly cited papers. And also in Women 2.0, which the website is below in the notes, they found that when tech companies uh, were started uh, with diverse members, they were 33% more capital efficient and they lasted longer. So in other words, diverse startup companies also had a better chance of success. And again, this is linked back to the fact that the more diverse people are, the more inclusive you are, the more ideas come forward because everybody doesn't have the same background or the same understanding or the same approach to problems. So we really do see with uh, statistics and data that diversity and inclusion can bring a lot of value to companies and to academic institutions. So now we can move on to page 16. So, however, uh, there is something here that we, we definitely need to look at, and that is there is a competitive advantage. However, if the workplace is not harmonious, in other words, if people don't come together to be inclusive, and understand the differences, adjust to them, 
and basically be willing to accept people who are different from themselves, then this will not produce the intended result. You'll have a lot of friction, you will have people who are uh, at odds with one another, and you won't get the result that you would like from the diverse and inclusive environment. So that's basically, you know, something that you have to be very, very attentive to. Not only is it diversity, but it's also inclusion that's important. So moving on to page uh, 17, we have some other statistics that show the minority changes the majority. So studies show that, again, if you get a dissent from someone different from yourself, you're more likely to take that and say, hmm, that's going to be somewhat thought-provoking. I have to understand that. I have to understand why that person doesn't agree with me, how, what they're thinking, what their point of view is. And so, which is an interesting outcome, People have to work harder, and they do, in diverse environments. So both cognitively, in other words, with their brains, and socially. Because when you meet people who are different from you, you have to actually work harder to understand those people. And this leads to better outcomes, whether it's socially or it's in the workplace. Because it really does stimulate your brain, and in other words, diversity will really make each person in the environment perform that much better. So that's a very nice outcome. But again, that's not always easy to achieve because people bring all of their own life uh, background and sometimes it's hard to adjust to people who aren't exactly uh, like yourself. So we'll move on to page 18. So now, we're going to look at this from a slightly different point of view, which is the demographic imperative. So moving on to page 19. I think we've all seen statistics. This is a, on the United States population. So on the left-hand side, you see the population in 2012 and the numbers. Um, if you make this, if you look at it, uh, you know, you'll see that the yellow is what we call non-Latino whites, and you'll see on the left-hand side it's quite a bit larger than it is on the right-hand side. And you'll also see that the other pieces of that pie are starting to grow, particular the, um, the bright green color, which is Latino. That grows considerably over this period from 2012 to 2050. So what does that mean? That means that our population is becoming more diverse, certainly. I think we see that in our own lives every day, especially if you live in uh, heavily populated areas like cities. You'll see a lot more people who uh, are different from you and your own background. So what does this mean in terms of education and in terms of, in particular, engineering education? So if we go to the next page, which is page 20, we see we need everyone on board to address the grand challenges of the coming decades. That's basically the message there. So in other words, we need, a, as statistics show, by 2050 we'll have a much greater need for engineers, for computer scientists, for PhDs in these fields to teach. And this is going to be challenging if we exclude piece of parts of the population. So in other words, while the population in the United States continues to change, we also have to look very closely that those new populations are reflected in engineering, in computer science, in STEM in general, because if they're not, then we're not pulling in, first of all, the kinds of people that we need or the numbers because the numbers will not meet the demand of 2050 if all we concentrate on are the typical populations that, uh, say right now in 2016, are the majority of people who work in the STEM fields. So it's really important that we start to look outside of those 
particular areas and figure out how do we bring in minorities, women, uh, all kinds of people who typically have not thought of engineering or the STEM fields as being something that they would be interested in or something that they might not even consider as a profession for themselves. That has to change in order for the United States in particular to be successful, where we have this constant melting pot, as we call it, where we constantly have the changing population, people coming in, um, people being integrated into the U.S., but in order to improve their, their standard of living as well as the country's overall, we really need to have a larger brain trust in areas where there will be challenges and jobs. So let's look at the data a little bit. So this is um, page 21. So where are we now in terms of our numbers? So on page 22, we're looking at bachelor of science degrees. And if you look on the left-hand side, you see the general U.S. population as, it, as it's reflected today with the uh, different colors indicating the different uh, types of, of races and ethnicities. And on the right-hand side, you see undergraduates in engineering. So you see that the degrees do not actually follow the same distribution as the population. And again, this, enth this even today, it points to the fact that many people do not see engineering or science as their chosen path. Perhaps it comes from their families not being in the field, they haven't been exposed to, to that type of, uh, of a profession, they may not know anyone who's in the STEM fields, they may not even know what people who work in those areas actually do. Like sometimes when I go to schools on, um, during National Engineers Week or during outreach activities with um, the Society of Women Engineers, I'll often say, well, I'm an electrical engineer. Um, does anybody know what a, an engineer does? And typically the answer you get um, is from children who haven't been exposed to the engineering profession is, oh, they drive trains or they drive the subway or something along those lines because they really don't have any exposure to those kinds of professions. But the reality is, is once you start to introduce children to things like robotics, programming, being able to invent things or innovate or build things, suddenly you see the light go off in their eyes and you see a whole other world opening up. You can practically see their brains turning like, wow, this is interesting, wow. I never knew that uh, people did this kind of stuff. And that's what we need to do. We need to focus on bringing the pop, reflecting in our professions, in our STEM professions, our, our general population, so that we can start to expand it and become a diverse and inclusive culture and reflect this in our industries in the US and in academia so that we bring the best and the brightest, regardless of where they come from, what their background is, what their ethnicity, gender, et cetera is, so that they can basically be exposed to these uh, great professions and, and build the country and the future together. So now we'll move on to um, page 23, and this is a section on inclusion. So inclusion, un unlike diversity, which really can be put into a pie chart and you can look at it, you can see, okay, we have this many kinds of people who self-identify as black or white, women, uh, American Indians, and you can identify them very clearly and you can go into a certain representative set, say it's a, a company or a university, and then you can actually measure diversity. Diversity is not hard to measure. However, inclusion, because it's a little bit softer, it can sometimes be what people think of as a point of view, and it's more about how people see the world. So that's a little bit harder 
to actually measure. So let's take a look at this. So if you move on to page 24, we see what is inclusion. So inclusion is, so let's talk about the characteristics of an, inclu an inclusive team environment. Well, if you have an inclusive team or environment, it first of all, it means that everyone is heard and respected. Well, so that is key, regardless of you know, where the person came from or uh, what their background is or what they look like. Everyone should be treated equally and with respect. And the second piece of this is, if that's the case, everyone should feel safe to propose new ideas. They shouldn't feel that their ideas will be ridiculed or not considered because of who they are. The ideas should be considered to be neutral regardless of the source of the ideas. Giving people decision-making authority. Again, not looking at them as being, oh, well, we couldn't give that person decision-making authority because he or she does not fit the mold of the typical leader or the typical person who gets to make decisions. Making sure we always share credit for success. This is key in all aspects of our life. And finally, making sure that there's a closed loop so that you can implement feedback from a team. So that's the characteristics of an inclusive team environment. As you can see, there's no pie chart there, and it's a little bit harder to um, actually measure it as easily as it is to measure diversity. So on page 25, um, we have an interesting curve when uh, the source is shown at the bottom there. So this is called the growth of an inclusive mindset. And basically what it says is there's, there's a curve where you go from denial that there are any differences or that you even see them to full adaptation to the fact that yes, there are differences, we acknowledge them, and we understand that everybody's not the same and we do our best to bridge across that. And in between are all the steps that go from denial, which says, I don't see any differences, or you minimize the differences, or you judge differences, to actually comprehending that the world is, is a very different place, there are different people, and you accept this. Once there's that acceptance in a culture, whether that culture is in a school, uh, whether it's in a, a workplace, whether a neighborhood, then you're really on the way to accepting people for who they are and not just counting beings, so to speak. It's saying, well, you know, we have a diverse population. We can count, we have 10 people of color or 10 women inside of our larger community, but rather that we, we bring them in, we include them, they are equal partners in that environment. So that's the key to inclusion. It's not just about counting things, it's also about culturally changing the way that people think and um, accept things. So now, as I said, um, there, it is very difficult to measure inclusion. However, you can measure the absence of inclusion. So um, that's like uh, not the positive, but the negative. So uh, on page 27, you see here, these are some statistics about discrimination on campuses in the United States, uh, college campuses. So. They, there was a study done with uh, almost 20,000 students in 26 colleges, and many of them say, yes, we have su uh, been subjected to discrimination of some type. It could be gender, it could be race, it could be religion, it could be age, but it shows that many people, nearly half the population of this uh, group felt that in some way, shape, or form, they had experienced some type of discrimination over the course of their career at, at the university. So this definitely shows that although 
the population may be diverse, people don't feel as though they have an equal footing necessarily on campus. So now we'll move to page 28. So this is something that uh, is an interesting statistic which uh, has been uh, in many papers over the last 20 years. I actually wrote a paper myself about this called uh, Persistence in the Workforce. So per what is persistence in the workforce? What that basically means is that you have people who get degrees, whether they're in science, technology, engineering, et cetera, et cetera. They come in and within a relatively short period of time, they leave the field. So this was an, uh, an article called Stemming the Tide. So it says, what fraction of engineering degree holders are working five years after graduation? And as you can see, the number for females is actually, and for also for African American males, is significantly lower than that for the traditional uh, STEM worker who is a white male in the United States. Uh, now, comparing this to non-engineering fields, you can see that while it's 38% in engineering, in non-engineering fields, it's only 20% of women leave the field. So it's quite a difference. And possessing an advanced degree increases a woman's chance of leaving the engineering workforce. So these are not good statistics, uh, again, showing that even though there may be diversity that women and African Americans, for instance, may be getting the degrees, once they enter the field, they do not feel included and eventually they make the decision to leave. So this is all another um, term that is used often about for this particular phenomenon is called uh, the leaky pipeline. So in other words, you may have like say, for instance, um, early in high school, you'll have a lot of girls in math and science. But as they pro uh, progress through their education, so many of them drop out. So by the time you get to the uh, first year of college, a huge m numbers have dropped out. And this is true of, of many minorities as well. And this is a phenomenon that's been traced over the last 40 or 50 years in the United States. There's been some abatement of it, but, n but not um, in numbers that would say, you know, we're making a lot of progress in terms of uh, having the number of women or blacks or uh, other types of minorities actually represented in the STEM professions in the same numbers or percentages that they're represented in the United States in general in our population. So it, let's move to um, the next page, which is page 29. So why should we care about this? So this page shows the cost of this exodus or leaving from the, pro from the profession. So for the individual, if you leave, uh, you're probably going to go into a field of lower wages and you're going to come out of this at the end of your life with a lot less earnings than you would have if you had stayed in the STEM field, which um, typically pay higher salaries than the non-STEM field. In the government field, you can have people um, who are PhDs, who cost significant or, or spend significant money, the government spends significant money to train them, and if you're losing them in a very short period of time, that's not a good investment, not to mention both for the individual and whoever paid the bills. For employers to invest significant dollars in hiring STEM uh, employees, bringing them in, training them, and then losing them after a few years just when perhaps they're hitting their stride and becoming more productive, well, that is certainly not going to be a very um, good outcome either. So for society in general, what we say is that currently we probably have more than 100,000 
are non-practicing STEM qualified workers. I think personally that number is probably significantly higher, but the point is is that the exodus of the non-typical person who enters STEM really does have impact all along the line, whether it's to the individual, the people who pay the bills, employers themselves who lose significant innovation, novel ideas, and to society in terms of solving a big problem. So now we'll move on to page 30. And now we talked about diversity, we talked about inclusion, and we talked about how it's hard to measure uh, what inclusion is. You can kind of like go from the flip side and say, well, I know what it isn't, and I know when it's not there. We looked at some of the costs of it. So what are some of the major barriers to inclusion? Well, two here that um, I'd like to spend a few minutes on are unconscious bias and what we call micro-messages. So if we move to page 31, we say that our objectivity is compromised by unconscious bias. So this means when someone has a bias towards somebody, basically because that person isn't just like them, and maybe they're not comfortable with that person. Oftentimes, bias is not malicious. It is not because people do it intentionally. It's because they haven't been challenged about their bias, or perhaps they have a certain way of thinking that is, um, uh, they grew up with it and are not necessarily uh, able to overcome it very easily. So this is also, this is what we call cognitive errors. Perhaps um, they make decisions uh, more quickly uh, based on that unconscious bias. For instance, you could look at somebody, they say something, you dismiss it because you're like, well, that person probably doesn't know what they're talking about. Now, sometimes biases could be advantageous. So for instance, uh, you often hear that um, when women go to get jobs, perhaps they don't get the same scrutiny as men in certain fields because a company, for instance, a large company may say, well, we need to hire you know, a certain percentage of women or, or blacks or Latinos. So that can be advantageous. But in the long run, it's probably disadvantageous for everyone because nobody wants to take an unfair advantage. You may be put in a job that you're not really capable of doing, and what that ends up doing is actually reinforcing the bias or the stereotype. See, so-and-so got hired, he or she wasn't qualified, and look at this, it's proving out the point. So we all need to be very, very attentive to our biases. So if we move on to page 32, this is, uh, if you have it in screen show mode, you'll see this better, but this is an interesting experiment. And really the question is, does bias affect our judgment? So this was a, a experiment that showed a man and a woman in silhouette who were actually the same height. But when people were asked about it, they thought the man was taller. So why is that the case? It, that's because I, of an unconscious bias that when you see a man, you may think that person is more capable, more relevant to whatever the topic is that you're evaluating that person for. So sometimes it's actually more advantageous during um, certain kinds of interviews to try and put that bias aside or consciously remember, especially if you're hiring someone, that don't just use what they look like as a criteria. In fact, that should not be your criteria. You should be assessing the person for the skills they bring to a table. So it says here, one of the results of this was using a screen to, in the, for an audition, increase the probability of women advancing by 50%. So that's a in very, very interesting outcome. Because once again, when our biases don't come into play or our cognitive uh, 
errors, you would say, then we're more apt to be fairer in our assessment. And this is really one of the um, things that people need to be aware of, especially if you're doing hiring in a company. And oftentimes in, in large companies in particular, you do see that HR organizations will train people before they're allowed to go out and interview and do hiring because they don't want people to bring these unconscious biases with them. So now we'll move on to page 33. So this is uh, another interesting phenomenon which is called micro-messaging. So what are micro-messages? These are unintended messages that may be communicated when we interact with someone. So I think one of the um, ones that we see sometimes in movies, which is kind of funny, uh, actually, we laugh at it, but it actually is a micro-message, is you'll see someone speaking to another person whose English is not that good. And they immediately raise their voice and start talking very loud as though that will change something. But it really gives the other, makes the other person very uncomfortable because suddenly they see someone who is supposed to be having a conversation with them and they're almost yelling at them. So that's a kind of a humorous example of it. But oftentimes what happens with these kind of micro inequalities or inequities is that the person who it's directed to loses confidence because they see that they're not being taken seriously that their contributions may be judged uh, too harshly. Uh, it can cause you to become hesitant um, or actually results in, your, in losing your own self-confidence. So I know myself and uh, in my career, I've often noticed that because I don't have a really loud voice, I, I would get overlooked, especially early in my career. And it made me very self-conscious and it made me hesitant to ever say anything because I really had this feeling that no one was ever listening. So we have to be very careful about that. And now in my own uh, job and in my career, I, what I've done is, what I do is when I have a large meeting and I see there's someone who's not participating, what I'll often do is go around the room and look at people and say, you know, so-and-so, do you have anything to contribute? Would you like to add anything? What a person hasn't been contributing. And oftentimes if somebody tries to interrupt, I will step in and say, could you please let, uh, you know, so-and-so finish their thought? Because this is another one of those micro messages when a person starts to speak, perhaps they're hesitant, not as confident as they should be, Oftentimes you'll see people cut them off, they'll jump in, they'll complete the sentences. And again, this creates an environment where the person who perhaps is a little bit um, outside the norm, you know, in the sense that they may not be just like everyone else, often will uh, feel uh, that they're not being taken seriously and this is actually kind of a vicious circle. So if we move on to chart 35, um, 34, I'm sorry. Um, this is some examples of the micro messages. So interactions with students. So this one shows that if a person is struggling, uh, for instance, a, a female student, the faculty member or, and again, my example in a, in a large meeting in a company is the same, people jump in and help. And what's the message? Oh, you, don't, you probably needed my help, even if you didn't need their help. And I often find that at this point in my career, if people do this to me, I'm not hesitant to say, please let me finish, please let me get my thought out. So I think that's an important thing to learn as well, that you need to stand up for yourself. And also with a student of color, uh, oftentimes there's a surprise in a professor's voice if they answer a, a student, uh, if the student answers correctly. But they won't engage the student, perhaps because as the uh, tagline says, oh, I don't believe you could go any further. That must have been a lucky guess, something like that. So again, 
kinds of messages, we have to be always be on our guard not to do things like that. So these are a lot of the uh, issues that we face in our, in our environments, uh, whether it's academia or it's industry, it can be a lot of the different things. So how can we improve inclusiveness via engineering education? This is the key and what a ABET is looking at. So this is page 36. So one thing is we want to have, uh, motivate how to have inclusive behaviors and why and how this leads to better groups, schools, and businesses. So this is the message of ABET. How do we motivate our constituency to say, you need to do this because in the long run, it's very beneficial. As I mentioned before, people need to be educated. They need to be aware of these, um, managing these issues and whatnot. Uh, we need to give people the proper tools, the students and to faculty and in, edu and in industries as well. Uh, and finally, we need to have models and practices where people can actually uh, develop the right skills. So these are some of the key factors in managing diversity and inclusion. You have to motivate the employees and students. You have to educate people effectively so that they understand, even though they may have these biases, and we all do, that they have to learn to recognize them and put them aside to be fair, not to speak in ways that demean other people or give them messages that their ideas and thoughts aren't important. And for students and for learning groups, for teachers, for professors, everybody has to have the right tools. So whether these tools are, are um, classes that focus on these things, uh, workshops, say brainstorming, um, acting sessions where you see people and talk about these things. Really, the focus is all about having people recognize what is inclusive and what is not. And then practicing these things. So these are the kind of things we have to think about. Is it possible to include these in an engineering education? So that's very key. And, and important that we, we cover these topics. And again, as we look at engineering education, which is always focused basically on the technical. You know, are you, do you have this many math courses, this many uh, computer science courses, chemistry, physics, whatever it is. Yes, all that's important, but now ABET is trying to say, we need to go beyond that because if we don't, we'll miss the opportunity to bring more people into the field. So if we go to page 37, this is, uh, we're at the uh, last piece now. So actually this is the area where I'm also looking for input from uh, the people who are listening in here. So how can ABET motivate change? As I said, it's not that early easy to do because of the fact that ABET has traditionally only focused on technical topics. So how do we now basically motivate this change as part of that accreditation system? So these are the objectives of, as I said, prepare, ABET's uh, mission is to make sure that anyone who graduates in applied science, computing, engineering, et cetera, is prepared to continue the practice of engineering in their profession. Also, to stimulate ABET's role is to improve technical education and encourage new and innovative approaches. Now, how do we fit diversity and inclusion into this w traditional kind of role, uh, objectives in the accreditation process. So some of the things that ABET is looking at is taking the criteria for evaluation of universities, which focus on how well your students are doing, how many students do you retain, what is your process for evaluating that you're covering all of the key technical areas, how do you do continuous improvement, 
what kind of criteria could we add into the ABET standard criteria to really be able to say uh, we're, we're also focusing on diversity and inclusion, but also not watering down the technical side of it. So if you look at page uh, 40, so page 40 are some sample survey questions that are on a survey, which I have the link for at the end of this presentation, which I would really appreciate if anyone who's watching today could take a look at this survey. It's not a long survey. It wouldn't take you, you know, more than 10 minutes to provide your thoughts. But um, the first of all, the first question, which I hope you'd answer yes to, is, is excellence in diversity and inclusion a marker of quality? In the, in, the pro, in the programs that ABED accredits. The second one is, what are your thoughts on what should, um, whether ABED should require institutions to reflect on their goals and processes in their continuous improvement areas of the accreditation process? The next one is, um, what are your thoughts on the criteria which you can find on the ABET uh, site? And, uh, the fourth question is about where, where should ABET consider diversity and inclusion? And then also some free forum boxes and any other thoughts that you have. This is a really important topic and it's really important that ABET have the right input from the constituency, from women in engineering, from SWE, from uh, WITI, from WePAN, and from everyone else who considers diversity and inclusion to be a key aspect of solving all the challenges that are here in our field over the next 30 or 40 years. But we can't do it alone. We really need people to let us know, let ABET know, what is it that we should do in terms of adding diversity and inclusion as part of the accreditation process for engineering schools. So this is a, a, a look at the survey, and then page 41, um, I'm showing the link to the survey. So if you go to that site, uh, it's abet.org surveys, you'll see that there's a survey and basically the questions on the previous page are included in that survey. So that's, uh, that's my uh, con the conclusion of my talk here. I want to thank everyone uh, for listening, and uh, I would really appreciate it, as I said, if people could um, com complete that survey. And uh, my last page here, which um, is page 47, shows inclusion is not a service placement or program. Inclusion is a mindset. So in other words, this is really about changing the way people look at things. So um, with that, I'd like to thank, first of all, the women in engineering for allowing me to do this chat. I'd like to thank ABET for uh, giving me this opportunity to be a part of this important initiative. And also the Society of Women Engineers. Um, I'm an active member. I'm currently the president of uh, SWE New York in New York City. And I've been very happy to have that role and to do many uh, engagements and many outreach activities uh, for students and for professionals. So again, thank you very much for listening and I hope you will take the survey.